there may be a mystery hidden in America's drinking water with frightening consequences. And what did you learn early on? We showed that atrazine demasculinized animals as well as feminized animals. So genetic males actually transformed into females. It's a chemical widely used on crops in the U.S. and often found in drinking water. We look at research that raises concerns about impacts on humans and questions about what happens when science conflicts with big industry interests. U.S. and U.K. strikes in Yemen were a clear message to the Houthis to stop their terrorist attacks in the Red Sea. There are concerns it's just the first phase in a wider war. Hamas does something in Gaza, Hezbollah starts firing from Lebanon, the Houthis start interfering with international shipping. This was the plan. This week, a look at an expanding conflict and concern. When disaster strikes, prized possessions can go up in smoke. And that can include cash. We are the only place that will replace money that's been damaged. We make a fascinating visit to the place where your mutilated money can regain its spending power. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We begin today with a disturbing scientific saga that demonstrates how far some will go to control what version of science gets told and how that could factor into emerging trends in human sexuality. 25 years ago, a researcher stumbled across what could be an important piece of the puzzle, but powerful forces have worked to silence and smear him, making it harder to get at the facts all these years later when they could matter the most. So here's what we do, molecular work. So students who we caught up with Tyrone Hayes in his lab at University of California, Berkeley, where he's a professor of integrative biology. So I am a developmental endocrinologist. That's mean, that means I'm interested in the role of hormones in regulating development. In particular, For our purposes, you can think of him as the frog professor. In 1998, Hayes was a young assistant professor when he got hired to conduct research for pharmaceutical and chemical giant Novartis. I was contracted by what was then Novartis to study atrazine, an herbicide, and to figure out if that herbicide somehow interfered with hormonal regulation of development. Atrazine is routinely used on corn crops, sugarcane, pineapple, sorghum, macadamia nuts, and evergreen tree farms and it's one of the most common contaminants in America's drinking water. In 1998, the government had announced a safety review that could have led to atrazine being restricted or banned. Novartis was hoping Hayes' research would help them prove it's safe. At the time, it was the number one selling product for Novartis. It was their number one selling agrochemical. And what did you learn early on? Early on, we showed that atrazine both uh, what I deemed demasculinized animals as well as feminized animals. So genetic males which should develop testis and um, a certain type of larynx or voice box for attracting females. That aspect was inhibited and those genetic males oftentimes developed ovaries and actually transformed into females. Not only did atrazine turn boy frogs into girls, Hayes discovered, some atrazine-exposed frogs also developed both male testes and female ovaries. But it's what the research implied about people that was most concerning. Was there resistance to making the findings that you had public at the time? Yes, so the company and the consulting firm that I actually was under contract for was not interested in me publishing the work. And in fact, it was covered in my contract that I needed permission from the company to publish the work. So what did you decide to do? Um, <clears throat> at some point, I became uncomfortable with some of the things that the company asked me to do. So I became uncomfortable with some of the interpretation and some of the, uh, quite honest, manipulations of the data that they were requesting. I decided to repeat the work without their funding so that I had freedom to publish and to discuss those data with scientists outside of my lab and outside of my university. 
crash the slide into the... Hayes's further research produced similar findings, not only in frogs, but also other species, and was published in prestigious journals. He reported that frogs developed hermaphroditism, having both female ovaries and male testes when exposed to atrazine levels far below what the EPA says is safe for people to drink. Hayes soon came to feel like Novartis public enemy number one. What are some of the things that happened to you as you conducted this research and published it? Well, <laughs> they did a lot of things to me. The company tried very hard to get the work retracted or to publish counter work or actually contact the university to try to get them to stop me from publishing. Internal documents were revealed years after Hayes' work for Novartis, after dozens of cities filed class action suits accusing the company of contaminating their drinking water and, quote, concealing atrazine's true dangerous nature. By then, Novartis had spun off its agrochemical business in atrazine to now China-owned Syngenta. In one document, Syngenta's PR team drafted a list of ways to attack the uncooperative professor. Discredit Hayes, reads one item, prevent citing of Hayes's data by revealing him as non-credible, ask journals to retract, set trap to entice him to sue, and investigate his wife. Purchase Tyrone Hayes as a search word on the internet so that anytime someone searches for Tyrone's material, the first thing they see is our material. Buy the search phrases amphibian Hayes, atrazine frogs, and frog feminization. Syngenta would later say that many of the documents refer to ideas that were never implemented. Hayes says he was smeared, his career threatened, and his life made into a living hell. There was a pressure to um, reevaluate data, to inappropriately manipulate data, to make it appear not as bad as it was. They hired other scientists to conduct experiments in ways that weren't informative. Um, well, and even some of the studies that they conducted found the same results, but they wrote something different. They actually launched personal attacks on me and they had plans was revealed uh, through documents obtained in a, in a court in a legal hearing they had plans to harass and pursue my students and my family the giant pr campaign to defend atrazine ultimately helped convince the epa to kick the can down the road for 20 years while the company continued to rake in billions and more data was produced then in 2020, the EPA finally made its decision. I published one paper with 22 co-authors from 12 different countries showing that atrazine was a reproductive toxin in fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and rodents. Uh, there are other studies that have examined human cell lines. There are correlational studies that have examined um, atrazine associated with a number of different adverse outcomes in humans, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, low sperm count, um, and a variety of different birth defects. In 2020, the EPA released its final assessment and concluded that atrazine is likely to affect 54% of all species and 42% of all critical habitats. In that same year, the EPA re-registered atrazine for use. Said it's okay to use. Said it's okay to use despite these preponderance of science showing that it has adverse effects on animals. To what do you attribute that? Uh, it makes somebody a lot of money. And there's a big lobby and industry has a big influence over decisions like the ones that the EPA have to make. From Syngenta's view, they simply did what was within their power to do to set the record straight with a product they defend as safe and to defend it from inaccurate and unfair attacks. Today, CDC's Division of Toxicology says atrazine can alter the way that the reproductive system works, may increase the risk of preterm delivery, may be linked to some types of cancer, caused liver, kidney, and heart damage in animals, and could cause these effects in humans. When pregnant women are exposed to atrazine in drinking water, it's associated with low fetal weight, and heart, urinary, and limb defects. High levels in pregnant animals caused reduced survival of fetuses. There are still many unknowns. CDC says little information is available regarding the effects of atrazine in children. 
which speaks to an elephant in the room. If this is a hormone disruptor, if this could be playing any role in what we're seeing happening in our youth today, when you, there's a lot of boys who say they feel like girls and girls who say they feel like boys. That's a tricky question. So let me ve be very clear. Um, the sex and gender identity and sexual orientation and preference are in part controlled by hormonal influences early in development in the womb. Um, and we know this, for example, that your relative exposure to androgens and estrogens and other steroids may shape the brain that may later determine those things. There are also genetic and social and other environmental influences as, as well. That all being said, there's very likely that chemicals like atrazine that can influence your hormonal balance, and we know it does so in humans, that that potentially could influence things like sex or gender identity and orientation. The problem is, Hayes' experience implies that studies with the answers may never be funded or at least published. Yeah, atrazine is to post a child because, one, we know what it does, we know it is not, it's not good, and it's everywhere. So that's why it's important. On the other hand, there, you know, we have something like 80,000 human-made chemicals in the world. Most of them haven't been studied in the level of detail that atrazine has. Most of the other compounds we use in agriculture, we know nothing about what they do. So yeah, we're missing a lot of information. Of the chemicals that I've studied though, atrazine is the one that keeps coming back. It's always there. We can always measure it in the environment and it always has some effect under almost any kind of condition that you use it. A few loose ends. In 2012, Syngenta settled state class action drinking water lawsuits, agreeing to pay $105 million, but denying any wrongdoing. The company continues to insist that atrazine does not cause any harm to people in normal real world exposures. Today, China-owned Syngenta reports sales of more than $16 billion a year in pesticide seeds and other products. We couldn't find anybody publicly studying the impact of atrazine or any other chemical or pharmaceutical product on transgender trends. When we return, a look at the threat of an expanding war in the Mideast. The war triggered by the Hamas Islamic terrorist attack on Israel on October 7th is sending tremors of expanding terrorism across the Mideast. The threat of a regional war is said to be growing. Scott Thuman speaks with an expert who says October 7 was just the beginning. The U.S. and U.K. airstrikes in Yemen this week were the latest sign of an expanding conflict targeting radar and air defense systems and sites for cruise missiles that were used to launch attacks on Red Sea shipping lanes over recent months. So how alarming would you say is this increased series of attacks on ships in the Red Sea by the Houthis? I think attacks in the Red Sea by the Houthis is extremely alarming, not only because of the massive impact it's had on uh, the international maritime trade, but also because the Houthis are a pretty small little group. They are not a tremendous transnational organization. Matthew Levitt is an expert on Mideast affairs with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He explains, based in Yemen, the Houthis have been fighting the Saudi-backed Yemeni government since 2004 in a war that has claimed nearly a quarter of a million lives. Since November, the group has turned its attention to commercial ships using the vital Red Sea route to the Suez Canal. 30% of container ship traffic normally uses these waters. Sometimes, sharing video of their attacks, the Houthis have been using missiles, drones, fast boats, and helicopters against ships. The Houthis became a player first in Yemen and then only later regionally. It's not just merchant ships that have come under attack. U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria have faced more than 120 attacks in just the last three months. The U.S. responded with a rare drone strike in Baghdad this month to take out the leader of an Iranian-backed armed group. These attacks on American 
soldiers and marines and sailors. It's happening a lot. There are a lot of attacks, but they haven't killed a lot of people. The fact that this is happening doesn't echo outside the Washington, D.C. beltway until Americans have been killed or injured. Escalating attacks and tensions on the border between Israel and Lebanon are ratcheting up at the same time. Last week, an Israeli strike in southern Lebanon killed a senior Hezbollah leader. So Hamas does something in Gaza, Hezbollah starts firing from Lebanon, the Houthis start um, interfering with international shipping in the Bab al-Mandab Strait. You have the uh, Shia militias um, harassing U.S. and other forces and bases in Syria and Iraq. This was the plan. Whose plan? Iran planned for a time when their proxies could do things in a somewhat coordinated way. What it means is that if you see that I've carried out an attack, you are prepared to do something as well. So. Hezbollah starts firing rockets into northern Israel, not only to harass them, but to draw forces from the south to the north. The Houthis start firing missiles into the Red Sea, interrupting international shipping, raiding ships, costing the international economy a tremendous amount of money and saying it's because of Israel. That was the plan, not a plan for a particular operation, but for a day when everybody would know that everybody had some role to play. I'm hearing this phrase, the axis of resistance. The phrase axis of resistance is the phrase that the Iranians use to refer to what we often describe as the Iran threat network. Their axis of resistance, of muqawama, as they put it in Arabic, uh, is Iran, it's Hezbollah, it's Hamas, it's the Houthis, it's the various Shia militias in Iraq. That's what we're seeing right now. And so if you're Iran, you're actually quite pleased with what's happening. What happens if Iran decides to stop just supporting its proxies and get its own hands dirty. The Iranians have a track record of not getting their hands dirty. The bottom line is Iran has a very strong track record of fighting to the last Arab. It wants others to fight its wars for it. But if the West decides to strike at the nation that's been guiding and funding groups behind the attacks, that could change overnight. If Iran is attacked, at home, it will get in the fight, no question. A critical line that, if crossed, could elevate a regional war to a world one. For Full Measure, I'm Scott Thuman in Washington. And when we come back, a surprising way Americans can recover the value of mutilated cash. Let's say you have a big bundle of cash and it all goes up in smoke in a fire. You might think you're out of luck, but there could be hope. Lisa Fletcher reports on an interesting but little known money back guarantee. Maui, Hawaii, August 8th. A massive wind fueled wildfire engulfs multiple communities on the west side of the island. By daybreak, clearing smoke reveals the extent of the damage. Many businesses were obliterated, along with the cash kept inside of them. So it may come as a surprise to many victims of the fire, or any fire, that charred cash, along as its U.S. currency, can be redeemed. I'm carefully pulling everything apart. I want to try to keep it as a whole note. Once I finish, I'll take them to my tissue paper. Not at a bank, but here, at the Mutilated Currency Division of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C. We are the only place that will replace money that's been damaged to the extent where it requires um, specialized examination to, to determine this value. Eric Walsh is the division's manager and says this little-known corner of the U.S. Treasury has been replacing damaged dollars free of charge since Andrew Jackson was president in the mid-1800s. So we get approximately 23,000 cases a year, and we uh, redeem uh, usually around 35 to $40 million. Claims are stored in this vault. Each package contains currency remnants, a letter explaining how the damage occurred, and an amount. I love putting puzzles together. As well. Sharon Williams is an examiner and investigates cases to make sure they add up. 
Today, she's working on one from a house fire in the Pacific Northwest. I'm actually very fine to mount what the customer has sent them. Once I finish, I'll take them to my tissue paper. The U.S. Treasury will issue a check for the lost amount if more than half of each note can be identified as U.S. currency. Do you have any idea how much money is here? Well, they claim 240000 And how far into it are you? They sent in 20 Tupperware here. So I just, this is the first one they've started. Fire isn't the only culprit. This was currency that was buried in the backyard. And, you know, it's just like clay, like cement clay. What I did, I soaked it in water so it could get soft, and I picked apart the uh, currency strips. Most bills have clear threads in the paper with the value of each note written on them. Glenn Chumpetaz, another examiner here, is separating those and will add them to verify the claim. How much mush money is allegedly here? Uh, they claim 40000 It might be less and maybe more. So when I get through with it, We'll see. There is no limit to the amount of mutilated currency the division will investigate. And apparently, no limit to the methods of mutilation either. What's the weirdest or most unusual case you've come across? We always suggest to send in the, the currency in its original package um, so no further damage comes to it. A farmer lost his wallet in, in the field, and when he discovered what happened to it, um, that the cow had eaten the wallet, he had um, a, several hundred dollars in there. So he butchered the cow and submitted the, uh, his claim with the cow's stomach. Ah. And so our examiners at that point had to deal with retrieving the wallet from the cow's stomach and processing that case. Bringing a whole new meaning to cash cow. For Full Measure, I'm Lisa Fletcher in Washington, D.C. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, a heart-wrenching report on Maddie, the child who may be the COVID vaccine's first young victim. She was in the original Pfizer vaccine trial. She had like what she described as electrical shocks going up and down her spine. Um, she said she felt like her, rip, her heart was being um, ripped out. So uh, chest pain, she had severe abdominal pain. She was hunched over when she walked through the door. Um, her t toes and her fingers were white, and they were like, when you touched them, they were ice cold um, and painful. Did you think right away that this was probably a vaccine reaction? 100%. There was nothing wrong with her prior to that. We'll have the disturbing story of what happened to Maddie that's next week on Full Measure. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.